itself. I don't know if we know what this world has been like throughout its existence. I don't know if we fully grasp. You know, some of us can remember 60 years ago, I remember when we'd walk across town, four or five year old boys to go swimming miles away and no thought of there being any danger of any kind and, and just life was it, uh, had a different feel about it. The, the air had a different quality about it. Everything was, and, and you go, well, I wish for those good old days. Or, uh, you know, I, I think, this is my, my guess, I think, I'm just talking randomly about the, the scenario we're involved. It's, it's nice to bring it up now and then because it's so impacting. It just hits us in the face every day. You may not want to see it, but it hits, hits you in the face every day. Uh, you know, I think that because the way God set up this country, it's not uh, we are special people. And I love the United States. I love the people of the United States. But boy, it's really easy to slip into a little pride mode. You know that uh, that uh, the only specialness, speciality to the country is the blessing that God has put on it. Amen. You know, is is the grace that God has shed on us from sea to shining sea. And so, I I think though. You, know, you have Christian scholars throughout history and uh, they really doubted that there would ever be a government that would be established before Jesus comes back that had a real strong Christian influence on it. I mean, because they had never seen it, they could not foresee it. Uh, but I think this country had such a unique beginning, uh, not that we could set it up that way. I mean, we're uh, running from... Uh, religious oppression on the other side of the world trying to find religious freedom yeah but even God was driving that we get over here in a fresh continent with a fresh start without all sorts of uh, governments to dominate and set up a new structure on a new new uh, blackboard that was clean so to speak it was ready to be written I mean it was really a unique unique scenario um, and then get over here and then the George Whitfield comes along in the, what, the Great Awakening, what they call happening. Entire cities getting saved, entire towns getting saved, and the godly influence on, uh, on this government before it started writing its concepts down. There was a godly influence powerfully imprinted on our culture. Uh, not because we were better people on this side of the Atlantic than the other side of the Atlantic. It's something I think God had set up. He was going to have uh, the world in its general mode. It was just going along with oppression and, and uh, religious persecution and on and on and on. And all of a sudden, this new mindset filters into this governmental paper that's written that we call the Constitution. And, and so we have been, I think, more blessed than we know. We have been so blessed to have experienced the type of peace to level, the level that there's been peace on Earth. That there's been. I mean, a lot of what we have sampled here in the first 200 years of our history, the world had seen very little of. Uh, any place on earth throughout history, very little of. And so here comes a, a level of peace, uh, of course, in the life to come, when the kings of this world become the kingdom of our Lord, the kingdom of our Christ, then, my goodness, I mean, Peace is going to go off the charts. Joy is going, the, all, all the goodnesses, the virtues, the wholeness of existence, the, just the, uh, we're going to love each other. I mean, more than we do now, we're going to love each other. And uh, we're going to look at each other and we're going to look so much more beautiful than we look right now. Partly because our bodies will be glorified, but partly because our hearts will be so so governed by his heart and his spirit. Uh, but so, so certain things are being challenged and it shouldn't be surprising. 
the, the founding fathers foresaw it. I mean, some of them were wondering if we could last 75 years without there being a, you know, without having to take up arms and refight for our freedom again. I mean, they were just thinking, man, you're going to really have to fight to try to keep this stuff. But God had established us on principles that were not usually not found in government foundations, in concepts and perspectives that were new to this world historically. And we got to, we got to enjoy the benefits of that. I mean, we have spent, I mean, even to this day, as much as we can say, oh, there's a lot of evil going on, we are experiencing more of the blessing of God than we know in this country, even to this moment. Right. And... Uh, but it's worth fighting for. And so uh, people could say, I wish there wouldn't be all the darkness and all the fight going on. Well, uh, let me give you some bad news. And that is that the conflict is the name of the game until Jesus returns. Uh, that battle is, is there. It's going to be there. It's going to be there on the personal level, the flesh and the spirit. It's going to be there on the national level. There's going to be conflict there. And, uh, but God can preserve so, uh, uh, the blessing that he wants on this country, and I think he will. That's my own personal conviction. I think we're going to come out of this smelling better than you think. Uh, even though it smells a little stinky at the moment, I think we're going to come out of here smelling good. Uh, uh, my best guess is we're heading in for the best of times because God did 1776 for a reason. He did it at this spot in history for a reason. He's got a world plan and a world design in motion. And, and he's not going to be uh, one-upped on. He's not going to, Satan is gonna, not going to sneak through and trip things up in a way that God didn't see it coming. Uh, none of that's going to happen. God's going to fulfill his purpose because uh, I thank God for our president. I do. I thank God for President Trump. I do. And, uh, but this doesn't depend on him. It depends on God. Uh, whatever he's been able to be and do, God has enabled him to be and do. And that encourages me because I, I, I myself consider that God will continue to enable him to be and do until his part gets played. And we have a part in it all too. I will not be surprised if we don't see a better demonstration of God's power. And by that I mean the goodnesses that were over this country when it started. The, even though the, there were big gaps, yeah, major gaps. Always have been, there's always been sin in the picture, always been evil in the picture. But nonetheless, comparatively, this, this land has been blessed and showered with grace. I think we're going to see a greater dose of that than this country knew ever in its history. I think we're going to see an unveiling of Jesus' goodness and character and demonstration, na nature and spirit in this land than it's ever seen before. And uh, uh, so uh, don't give up, don't lose heart. On any given day, it can look like it's falling apart today, you know? Yesterday it looked like it was coming together. Today it looks like it's falling apart. Uh, don't believe those things, okay? Don't get so tossed. Don't get so torn by uh, the, the things that, that come up. Things don't seem to work right. This is, this is about conflict until Jesus reigns ultimately. Uh, but uh, that's the way it is. Amen. So you just heard it. <laughs> Um, I want to give you five things. I've been waiting to just give it to you for a long time, but I think I'll give it to you now. I think, I think God wants to give it now. Um, you've heard part of it, but let me try to give you a larger picture. One, the blood of Christ has bought you everything there is in Christ. He's bought you Christ. He's bought you all of the inheritance that comes with Christ. But can I let you know that there is no inheritance outside of Jesus himself. There is no life, there is no wisdom. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ. All of the healing is in Christ. All of the, all of the power is in Christ. And so, but that has been purchased. You have received Christ and all of the blessings of God. 
co-heirs with Jesus. It's in Jesus. And that now has been granted to you the authority to partake of the feast that's on the table. You have the right to eat. You have the right to drink. You have a right to share in all of the undeserved goodnesses that God has made available to, to humanity. You are no less qualified than any other human being. You are no less deserving than any other human being because we have all been disqualified. We have all been undeserving except for the gift of Jesus Christ to us. So number one is the blood. Got that? The blood says today I have a right to approach God. Today I have a right to receive from God. Today I have the right to fellowship with God. Today I have the right to speak to him and be heard by him today and it, uh, by the blood of Jesus stand on that every day from now on because some days you'll perform better some days you'll perform worse and some days you won't even feel or think or look like a Christian some days you'll be sitting there going I don't deserve anything from you God okay the blood of J Jesus makes it possible so the blood of Jesus number two the Spirit of God therefore walks with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you even till the end of the age. The Spirit of God is with you. And what he's with you to help you do is to help you see Jesus. To help you to move into that relationship with Jesus. So number one is the blood. Gives you the right. Number two uh, is the power. The Spirit of God that gives you the power. So you have the authority which is the legal right blood. You have the dunamis, which is the, the power, operational power, that's by the Spirit. Now, where we need the Spirit is all over, you know, all, of, all over our lives, on every facet, because there is no spiritual ability we have outside of the Holy Spirit himself. Right. We cannot see anything, we cannot hear anything, we cannot understand anything. We have no in our flesh, no ability to grasp any level of truth in God unless the Spirit of God brings that about for us. So we're, we're ultimately and totally dependent on the blood of Christ, the Spirit of Christ to help walk with us. And then we have the Word, right? Number three, the Word. In the Word, in the Word, Christ is revealed. Because of the blood by the Spirit, Christ is revealed. Christ is revealed. Number three, right? So number one? Blood. blood. Number two? Spirit. Number three. Word. Okay. Now, number three, the word. Number four is hold on to that baby. Hold on to not only any uh, uh, pronouncement he's made, not only any specific promise, not only any specific scripture. Hold on to your grasp of the value of the word to your life. Let the word become to you. It is, it is uh, the Bible says, they will hear my voice and they will live. Yes. They will hear my voice and they will live. The, in Isaiah 55, it says that my word is going to be like the rain coming out of the sky. It's going to be like the snow coming down. It will have its effect. And, and it will, things will, fruit will grow, things will grow. And it's not going to mock you. It's not going to tease, say, oh, I'm partway down. I think I'll go back up. No, if, if God puts out his word, it lands on you. You're the ground. It lands on you. And it will do what he has said that it will do. It will do that. But do you understand that we have in us now the Spirit of God in our spirits. We have in us all of the goodness of God. We have within us contained already all the truth of God. We have the mind of Christ already wrapped up inside of us. We have the power. Man, if we could grasp, you know, you see those uh, nebulae out there, you know, the pictures of these gaseous things that, and, and the the, the, you have the earth, a million of these in our sun, a million suns in one of the blue giants out there, and then you have a hundred billion of those in one galaxy, and then you've got over a hundred billion galaxies, and now they're starting to assume that there are untold numbers of universes out there beyond. You know, you have this thing, 
And this Jesus that's in your heart not only spoke that galaxy with a hundred billion stars, spoke it into existence. He's upholding it by the word of his power. And it will all come back to him because he's the goal of it all. And he's sitting there in a body like ours. The Bible says that at the judgment, white judgment seat of Christ, that all of the earth and all of space will flee and not find a place to run at the sight of his breath. When he gets up to judge the world, it, the Father honored, it says in, in John chapter 5, chapter 6, <laughs> I had to reach for it. The, the Father, he said that, man, you will honor me as you've honored the Father. You know, talk, talk about a name uh, claim to deity there. You know, any honor you give the Father, I get the same honor. I get the same value. I get the same worth. I'm God, like he's God. And he says, and the Father has given me, he said, you think you've seen great things? He just healed a guy that had been at that pool, but doesn't had been uh, lame for 38 years. And he said, you think that's good? I'm going to show you things that will cause you to marvel. What will you do, Jesus? He says, the Father has given me life within myself just as he has life within himself. I am an original fountain. I'm God. I'm an original source of life itself. And he says that I am going to speak now and the dead will hear. That's happened to us. We've come to life. But he says the day is coming when the Son of Man will put out his voice and all those that are buried in the grave, all those that have gone before will come back to life. He's talking about, you want to see some miraculous things? You're going to see some things. And I'm going to do them. And that all the world will be raised from the dead and the Father has given me authority to judge them all. Because I'm human. And I'm God. So because he has his own flesh, glorified as it is because he has because he's a man he's going to stand up before humanity now he's not going to condemn he doesn't need to condemn their thoughts will accuse their thoughts will condemn Moses will condemn uh, the Queen of Sheba will there is going to be a lot of testimony against mankind and all Jesus has to do is give the judgment that's all he has to do give the judgment but he says you think I'm going to be honored I will be honored now, we're giving him some honor today. It's only you, Jesus. It's only you. We're giving him honor. But someday, I'll tell you that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess and go down. And we'll give him honor. Sooner or later, it will all give him honor. And he will make the judgments. Amazing who this one we call Jesus is. Yes. Amazing who he truly is. Ah, uh, one more thing about the cross. I've said it before, but I have to say it again. When he died on that cross, his flesh looked ugly because it was taking our place. His flesh looked weak because it was taking our place. Not only his body, but his soul was taking our place. But he was two natures in one person. He was totally and truly the human nature. But at the same time, he was totally and truly God, even though his glory was shielded from our eyesight. He was fully God, though his glory was not exposed to us except through the healing miracles that he did. Truly God. And so in that being on the cross, there was the human flesh that became the target of our sin and our punishment. The body and the soul that was human was just ripped to shreds. And at the same time, I believe at the same moment that the Father turned his eyes away and he said, why have you forsaken me? I believe that in the heart of the Father there was never, while the anger was coming against the sin, there was never so much love as he had for the, his son at that point in time. <laughs> while our flesh saw flesh paying the price, the spirit that was also part of that one person, there was the human nature, but then there was the divine nature. And that divine nature that was keeping it all on track, keeping the human soul in line, keeping the whole human body in line. Come on, guys, we're getting there. Come on, guys, we're going to make it. We're going to get this thing done. 
I believe heaven was registering something that our eyes could not see. And that is a glory exploding on that cross like the world has never seen. He was doing something so strong, all we see is weakness because the flesh was being destroyed. But the God that he was, was doing something. He was destroying the thing that had destroyed humanity. He was eliminating the things that had separated us from God. And he was showing a beauty that his father, at the same time as he had to look away because the sin was being judged, the father was going, I love my son. He lays his life down yeah. for the sheep. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, God, give us eyes so we can see now because so many things we get so confused because we're looking with the flesh and we're looking at flesh from flesh and all we see is flesh and we're totally misinterpreting what God is doing on earth. And if we could see with his eyes, we would see the beauty of God in the middle of those things that we go, oh, that's ugly. No, you don't see what God's up to. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> you want to say that, right? Yes. <laughs> Ah, uh, sooner or later, we're going to see Jesus better and better and better. And the better you and I see him, the more we'll be changed. Number one was what? Thank you. Number two? Number three? Number four? Hold on to that baby. You get the word, hold on to it. See, like the snow coming down, like the... My word, because my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways, my ways are as high as the heaven above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. So I will speak. My word will come down. And, and what's happening is the spirit that's in us is wanting to bleed out. It's wanting to leak. It's wanting to rain. See, we had our soul and body above our spirit and that's what separated us from God. Jesus flipped it. His spirit was above his soul and body. And now in Christ our spirits are above our soul and body. So he says I will speak, I will, I will speak to you and through my word it'll be like rain coming down on you and your spirit is wanting to rain out the life of God into your soul and in your body. And how he does that is through his word, by his spirit, because of the blood. He wants there to be a snowfall, a rain on your soul, because if you will receive the word by the spirit, it will, it will, it will, what do you call it? It'll moisturize you. It'll give you life-bearing qualities. It will bring about fruit. But we, it always compares to Plants coming up out of the ground. Give her time. Give her time. Well, blood, spirit, word, hold on. Because number five, had to come up with number five. Number five, the grace number. Number five is this, because there's a resurrection on its way. Because there's a resurrection on its way. One, two, three, and four is pre-resurrection. Five is now it's coming to where eyes and ears can see and hear, where it's beginning to manifest to the flesh, where it's beginning to manifest to the flesh. Now I'll tell you, you don't need to have things manifesting yet to the flesh to enjoy the benefit of what God provides by his word in the spirit. I think there is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, when your spirit begins to influence your soul and take over your soul, that just makes heaven on earth. It's not blessing too many people, but it's sure blessing you. So I think there is getting into the Word in such a way that you're seeing Jesus in there, and you're growing in Jesus in, in the Word of God that is actually producing fruit on the inside of you, but it's not showing outside yet. But I'll tell you that, that Jesus has a resurrected life plan for you and me. And why this is important is because I think 
that this world, I, I, how do I say it? Though we have been freed from the flesh through the cross, we died in the flesh, we've been made alive, we've been raised from the dead at the cross, but we who have been freed from the flesh nonetheless have the freedom to live according to the flesh, set our minds on the flesh, and suffer the difficulties that the flesh provides if we want to remain focused over there. So there is a flesh way to live that Christians don't have to live because he's given us an alternative that those that are outside of Christ can't enjoy. Outside of Christ, you're stuck. Inside of Christ, you have an option. Now, the problem is that if we live by the flesh here, it just causes us all sorts of tr trouble. When Jesus said, when Jesus said, if you look into the Word, you look into the Bible because you think, in my Word, you have eternal life. I thought that. Didn't you think that? He said, but you refuse to come to me because the scriptures testify of me and I will give you that life. So is there eternal life in the scripture? Yes. But it's in Christ right. who's in the scripture. Right. But I, I want to tell you that as a charismatic, spiritual Christian, you can grow up with this idea. There's life in the scripture, but refuse to come to him that the scripture testifies to. In other ways, there's a, there's a flesh way to be in the scripture. Not just go out and drink and drug and, you know, not that. There's a flesh way to be, quote unquote, spiritual that really isn't spiritual at all. Right. So you can approach the scripture in the wrong way and not end up coming to Jesus via the scripture, which is the scripture's job. This is, let me tell you, the scripture's job is to testify to Jesus and point us there. And there we receive the life, right? Jesus said to this uh, woman at the well, Samaritan woman, let's talk about worship. It says, there's a time coming where people will worship and must worship in spirit and truth because my Father's spirit, and that's the way you must worship me. So it, is it possible not to worship in spirit and truth? Yeah, it's possible to not wor worship in spirit and truth. I think I've done a lot of that, not knowing any better. I think I've done a lot of Bible study in the flesh without knowing any better and didn't find Jesus in it and didn't find life in it. And then one other conundrum. He had just divided the loaves for 5,000 people. Men, plus women and children. He sends his disciples out in the boats. The people want to make him king now because they think this is the Messiah. Look at what he did. This is the Messiah. Has to be the Messiah. Did they believe he was the Messiah? Yeah. They were all excited. Jesus hides because he doesn't want them to do it. He doesn't want them to tr come and make him king. Even though they thought he was the Messiah and we're going to help make him Messiah. It's not this way. No. So he hides in the mountain. They're out on the boat. He eventually goes out on the water. They freak out. He says, it's okay, it's me. Then they let him get into the boat. So I, I don't know if they were keep not letting him get in the boat, but now he said, it's me. So they let him get in the boat. And immediately they were on the other side. Just bam. It just transported about three or four miles together. Bam, on the other side. So now they're at the lake at Capernaum, or the lake side. All the people that were looking for him over here give up. We can't find him in the mountain. So now they're running around to where they thought the disciples were going to land in Capernaum. And they show up and they ask him, how did you get here? When did you get here? Now he could have said, I just walked on the water. And, I, and bam, we were on the other side like that. He, but he didn't. He told him, he said, you're chasing me. Because they were. They had been up running all night. They were running around all night. They run all the way miles and miles and miles. And now they caught up to him. And Jesus said, you're chasing me because I can fill your stomachs. 
but you didn't see the miracle. And you go, what do you mean you didn't see the miracle? They saw the miracle. In fact, they wanted to make him the Messiah. They wanted him to do more. They saw it. They understood that's a miracle. What was going on there? Is that Jesus lived in the spirit. And all of humanity lived on the flesh. And whether it was in the scripture, or in worship, or seeing miracles even. See, I've seen miracles where I knew it was a miracle. I knew it was from God. I was giddy and happy because it helped me, it touched me, it blessed me. Good to be happy. But I'll tell you, the miracles are there to show you something about Jesus that you can't get in the flesh. The miracles are there to help bump you up to his level. To help you get out of the, the mental, emotional, willpower way of understanding things and get into the spirit where he lives. And gain from that miracle. You didn't see the miracle. You didn't see what it was telling you. It was telling you there's a whole different existence. And you can't come and make me Messiah because you're doing it down on this level. And you have to come up with me on this level. And then you can learn from me. And I'll show you how I am Messiah. Does that make sense? Somebody wants me to teach you in such a way that I help you to learn, live. I need to help you learn to live. I'd like to do that. But there are two ways to do that. Number one is on the flesh level. Where I, from my flesh, will help your flesh and our flesh to get all our flesh together and by our mind, will, and emotions we're going to live up to these standards that the Bible tells us to live up to. The second way to help you learn how to live is to help you believe in the blood, believe in the Spirit, get into the Word, hold on to the Word, until Jesus begins to bear fruit that becomes visible in your life, until the resurrection occurs. And there's no way that you and I can live that supernatural, spiritual life without going, yeah, I want to know Jesus. Yes, you will know Jesus and his death and his resurrection, but you're not going to know him without his death and without his resurrection. You're not going to have, live the Holy Spirit life that's full of life and full of God unless you live it like he did. The blood, the spirit, the word, keeping that in the soil there and then the resurrection begins to occur and so every change in you is a resurrection change. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Every loving love coming out of you is not trying to do it with the flesh and so I love you but you don't. All the love we have is coming out of this resurrected process. I want to personally see Jesus until it changes me. I want to see Jesus until his word is filling my life and then producing fruit in time behind me. This is the second thing I want. I want to help other people to do that too. Why don't people get there? Because we think the flesh is a quicker way to get there. But it'll never produce a resurrection. Only going this route will do it. Are you getting it? Yes. Okay, let's stand up. 